So first of all, I wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to join us this evening. We're very excited for the talk that we have planned with Dr. Oakley. I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Jyoti. Um, I work with Zion Plus, um, with Tiva. I'm sure you've heard of us. And um, I'm the, the marketing manager for the healthcare professional side on, for the business. And um, basically, I'm just going to go over the agenda real quick. So for our talk, we have about, um, we're on until about 8.45. And for the agenda, we will go through the presentation. And after that, we're going to do a Q&A. So just be sure to put your questions in the chat or the Q&A box, whichever you prefer, throughout the presentation. We'll be making a note of them. And then we'll do our best to, Dr. Oakley will do her best to get through them as many as she can. Um, following the Q&A, we are going to move into our live, I think there's an echo as well. Okay, let me see. Sorry, you guys, just one moment. Dr. Oakley, do you mind muting for just one moment and I'll chat? That work? Oh, no. Oh, you're, um, I think, I think it's fine. I'm almost done. I'm just going to be a minute and then the echo should be done. So thank you guys. Um, okay, so basically we're going to move into the raffle, a live raffle. So just be sure to stay on. So if we mention your name, you're going to have to like put it in the chat box so that we can make sure that you are there and then we'll email you the, the Amazon gift card. After the raffle, we're going to just stay on for anybody who has any questions about any Utiva products. We'll do a quick product presentation if you're interested. Okay. And another thing I just wanted to mention was that the talk will be recorded. We'll be sending the replay out early next week. And I think that's about it. So with that, I'm going to, sorry, there's a few more questions here. Do you have two computers? I hope the echo is okay now. I don't hear it. Um, give me one moment, you guys. Apologies. No, I think we're good. Okay, so um, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say that before we move on to the presentation, there's um, one more thing um, in terms of the uh, certificate of attendance. Uh, we will share that link in the chat box near the end. Um, and if you uh, still don't catch it, you can always email us and we'll send you that. Okay, so with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Oakley. So Dr. Oakley is a fellowship trained, double board certified, FPMRS surgeon in private practice for 10 years with St. Elizabeth Physicians in Northern Kentucky or Greater Cincinnati area. She served as the inaugural chair of the St. Elizabeth Healthcare Women's Health Institute while also serving on the board of directors for eight years. Currently, Dr. Oakley is on the leadership council for oncology disease management teams at the St. Elizabeth Healthcare Cancer Hospital. She's married to an engineer and they have two young daughters who love piano, golf and dance in Dr. Oakley's spare time. She co-hosts a weekly podcast called The Lady Bot, and she is from Pinehurst, North Carolina, and still a proud Tar Heel, getting home often in order to see her family. Thank you, Dr. Oakley. We're so happy to have you here. And I apologize, you guys, for the echo. I think it's me, Dr. Oakley. Should be good. Does that sound okay? Do you hear the echo from my end of things? You're good, Hopefully. Dr. Oakley. You're good. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jyoti. I really appreciate the introduction and I sincerely appreciate all of you spending this time with me. So whether you're from Texas or Australia, um, depending on the time of day or night, I'm sincerely grateful again for you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, my schedule right now is typically putting my daughters to bed. So if you hear them in the background, I apologize. <laughs> my husband's trying to wrangle them. Uh, so if there is an echo or noise, again, I apologize, uh, but I do appreciate your time. Uh, so y'all already heard my background just a little bit more, uh, which helps to explain why we're talking about this topic today, is that I lived and worked in the Middle East, uh, specifically in the southern desert part of Israel for four years. And I also have lived and worked in Malawi, Ethiopia, Ken Kenya several times, and Honduras. Uh, so through my mission work and the mission work of my father, who's also a surgeon, 
we've come to pick up little tips and tricks, right? And that's what tonight is about, tips and tricks, uh, really understanding vaginal health and how to prevent these recurrent infections that plague the women that we see in our practices. So whether you're a pharmacist tonight, primary care or gynecologist, welcome. And hopefully you as well pick up some tips and tricks. I by no means am an expert. So I just love it when people say that I am, um, but I'll try to give you my best expert opinion uh, throughout the talk tonight. Jyoti says I talk too long. So I'm gonna try and breeze through this so we can get to all of your questions and I can hopefully answer or some things that were on your mind. I have no relevant financial disclosures in regards to tonight's topic. Uh, we are going to go over just a little introduction. I want to specify some definitions and then review briefly some epidemiology, talk about risk factors for the recurrence of vaginal infections, and then finally how to evaluate and sort of mitigate the symptoms so that these infections don't recur. And as always, we have two case studies at the end. So for our introduction, I think we can all appreciate that these vaginal infections, specifically bacterial vaginosis and yeast vulvovaginitis, affect the quality of life for our female patients. It can even cause loss of time at school and days missed at the workplace. They also affect intimacy for so many women. It's a driving force for the lack of sexual desire, leading to hypoactive sexual desire disorder, among other pelvic pain uh, syndromes and complex issues related to intimacy. Vaginal infections increase medical visits and medical costs, and having a recurrent bacterial vaginosis, for example, can even lead to preterm labor and delivery for those women who are conceiving and in their reproductive years. So a very important topic. As you know, bacterial vaginosis or BV, as I will sometimes say throughout the lecture tonight, is a clinical condition. And even though I say the word culture here, really we're talking about swab. So a positive swab defining the bacteria leading to the vaginosis or vaginitis. Typically it's a shift towards anaerobes. Uh, a lot of us may be working in a work environment or laboratory, which allows for certain swabs to investigate the presence of aerobic or anaerobic bacteria, uh, whether it's in a wound culture or other cultures like a vaginal swab. So I'll interchange the word culture with swab, even though typically I do mean swab. So I apologize ahead of time. We Southerners sometimes get things wrong. But with this bacterial vaginosis, we do have an abnormal discharge, usually with an odor and an increased pH towards the more alkaline part of the spectrum, whereas a normal vaginal pH is typically more acidic between 4.0 and 4.5. A recurrence of bacterial vaginosis is really important for us to know tonight. So everything hinges on this definition, having three or more episodes of symptomatic vaginosis. Again, we're looking for odor and discharge, and that's what we mean by symptomatic. And these episodes require antimicrobial treatment. It's interesting that 50% of these infections are self-limiting and just when left alone, the vagina's natural flora and fauna will actually help these to resolve. And that can happen whether you're pregnant or not pregnant, but a recurrent infection again is three or more episodes requiring treatment. And these can be based on uh, symptoms, but also on the positive swab. Similarly, yeast vulvovaginitis, or what I might call VV throughout the talk tonight, is also a clinical condition with a positive culture or swab. Typically, though, we're looking at an overgrowth of fungus, typically candida, and the symptoms are less odor and more burning, itching, and redness of the vulva. This can often be confused with perimenopausal symptoms such as atrophy or a dermatitis which is contact dermatitis typically, usually the result of urinary leakage and that urine being sort of caustic to the vulvar skin. So this is sometimes a tough one and that's why having a positive swab or culture is so critical. Uh, not always does a woman have that thick cottage cheese appearance to her discharge. Sometimes there really is just irritation and redness to the external skin or vulva and there 
might not be any presence of white thick vaginal discharge at all. A recurrence of yeast is usually four or more episodes within a 12 month time frame. There is some recent literature to suggest that we really should kind of hang our hat on three cultures within a 12 month time frame when it comes to recurrent yeast infections. Now these cannot be related to antibiotic use, right? So we just said a cause of redness and irritation may be urinary incontinence. Uh, sometimes that leakage comes from a urinary tract infection. And even that redness or burning can make us think it's a UTI. Uh, so you give them an antibiotic. They say that the urinary symptoms clear up, but now their vaginal irritation is even worse. So it may have been that she had a yeast infection all along. We can't typically count that as a recurrence, though, for this strict definition, because these three or more episodes per year cannot be related to that antibiotic use. And I'm sure we all have female patients that will swear they get a yeast infection every time they're given an antibiotic whether true or not. <laughs> so a little bit more background about those definitions. Just be mindful that tonight we really want to rely upon those strict definitions and having objective laboratory data. Far too often, we will have women come in and just be concerned about discharge in general. It's a non-infectious etiology. It's not related truly to what we're talking about tonight, but I think it's really important to mention that we see a large amount of, of women in our practice that just say, you know, I don't like the odor of the vagina, right? I don't like the amount of discharge in the vagina. And it is our job to reassure these female patients that they should be making enough vaginal discharge to fill a shot glass every day. Now, most people understand what a shot glass looks like, um, whether they drink alcohol or not. So I think it's a good gauge to sort of say that and help them visualize. I think they then become aware that's a lot of discharge, but it's normal. It's totally a normal amount. So about four milliliters of vaginal discharge per day during reproductive years when we have well estrogenized tissue and good vaginal rugae or folds of skin. And that discharge is usually, it looks like mucus or what we say as snot down in the South. So snot type, it's thin, it can be ranging from clear to white. And uh, again, our vaginas are usually acidic in that pH of 4.0 range. And this is due to that glycogen that's converted to lactic acid by our natural flora and fauna right? That good bacteria that's called lactobacilli. So estrogen is helping to create this situation. And then that leads to the lactic acid, which keeps our vagina like a self-cleaning oven, right? Uh, so vagina usually takes care of itself with the lactobacilli and on microscopy with any sort of vaginal discharge swab that's normal, you'll see that lactobacilli and some white cells. Uh, increased discharge is typically normal, and we want to reassure our female patients of this. And again, reminding them that odor is also normal. So it's probably time to let you know that I had a different title to this lecture tonight, and it didn't seem appealing to sort of the larger audience. But where I'm from, uh, this lecture is typically named When Good Vaginas Go Bad, and that works in the South in the Southern part of the United States. It's something women can connect to, right? That we all have a good vagina, but what happens when there's a smell, when there's an atypical discharge, when there's a recurrence of infections. But again, first and foremost, it's really important to remind everyone that a good vagina, a normal vagina has a lot of discharge and a musty odor at baseline. Again, these characteristics are normal and we wanna base our decision on recurrent infections and how to prevent them on abnormal findings, right? What's the objective data? So with BV, again, we'll have an alkaline, not an acidic environment, a fishy odor. For example, if you take a KOH substance and do a 10% KOH and just mm. do a little eyedropper mm. onto a sample of mm. discharge, then you will actually get like a positive whiff test from the amines that are released. Um, the discharge in these patients typically are tan, yellow, white, or even gray, even gray with 
yeast, you may drop that 10% KOH on the microscopy slide like you see here on your screen, and it will help to sort of destroy everything around the budding yeast and pseudo-hyphae that you see in the picture, but you won't get that positive whiff test. It won't release any amines if there's yeast present. So again, what's the background to all of this, right? Who cares? What's the clinical significance and quote, having a good vagina go bad? Vaginitis is one of the most common reasons that women seek medical treatment. We are obsessed with our vaginas and the odor and discharge coming from them. But if you see here, and again, I'm sorry, I don't have statistics for other countries, but up to 8 million healthcare visits in the United States alone per year. And sadly, only 50% of those cases are optimally managed. And we all know, especially if there's pharmacists uh, participating tonight in the seminar, you know that the biggest grief we have is that doctors just give antibiotics to people for anything and everything. And that starts to create a resistance. And that's not a good thing, right? So we really want to optimize treatment and we want to base it on objective data and not always um, symptoms because women, they can convince us of anything, right? I'm a woman. And we'll say, we know we have an infection and give us those antibiotics, but we really want to, again, rely on objective data because inappropriate treatment can impact a woman's reproductive health. How much antibiotic are we giving to her? Is, is it appropriate? Are we increasing her risk for colon cancer with overuse of antibiotics and increasing her risk of things like Clostridium difficile infections in the bowel. Uh, we, we have good research to say we typically increase the risk of sexually transmitted infections by inappropriately managing these recurrent infections. And then finally, the recurrence, right, which is what we're talking about tonight and the resistance of certain strains. So we know that BV is the most common cause of abnormal vaginal discharge in reproductive age women. Higher prevalence in African uh, women, uh, again, whether African-American or African descent, and that ethnicity and risk associated with that is really important to remember. With VV or uh, vul vulvar, vulvovaginitis, excuse me, um, whether it's a strain like albicans, which is common, or glabrata, which is uncommon and resistant, uh, it can affect up to 10% of the female population. And again, recurrence is relatively common. So what are some risk factors towards this recurrence? Because again, we have to be able to pull this out of our patients and with their history and exam. So we know risk factors for bacterial vaginosis, vaginosis can include sexual activity, and I want to specify this is not an STD, right? In and of itself, it is actually not considered a sexually transmitted disease or infection, but it is associated with sexual activity. And typically, it's unlikely we would diagnose this in a woman who's never had intercourse, right? Um, so she doesn't have to be sexually active right now in this moment to have BV, um, but it is associated with sexual activity and increases her um, or it increases her risk of having BV if she's had a previously diagnosed uh, sexually transmitted infection as well. Again, African-American ethnicity, smoking, douching, douching strips your natural lactobacilli or good bacteria from the vaginal lumen. And then finally, we do have good research to say that recurrence of BV is associated with a high fat diet or one that is low in folate or calcium. And then great research to associate it with an overweight body mass index or obesity. With vaginitis or yeast vaginitis, um, again, we see this in women who have some sort of immunosuppression, whether that's because they're taking a biologic for their autoimmune condition like arthritis or lupus, or they're suppressed because of chemo, or they have diabetes, uh, whether well-controlled or not, these are all risk factors for yeast. Antibiotic use, which we mentioned before, changes that pH balance and puts them at risk for yeast. Sexual activity, a genetic susceptibility towards yeast strains, and then really high estrogen conditions such as pregnancy. 
So when we are diagnosing our patients, always start with a physical exam. And of course, as a pelvic reconstructive surgeon, I prefer a pelvic exam with speculum as well. There's just nothing like seeing the issue and really touching it with your hands. I think mapping out a woman's discomfort and letting her know you're not trying to alarm her or cause her pain or inflict pain, but just mapping out her pain with a very full pelvic exam of the vulva and groin, perineum, and vagina is really critical. Uh, again, you want to see that redness or irritation from the yeast vaginitis, or you want to sort of do your own positive whiff test. A lot of times BV is diagnosed just by entering the room and you can almost smell that yourself without any microscopy or preparation with KOH. And then finally, the speculum exam to visualize any thick white cottage cheese discharged adherent to the vaginal walls or more of that thin mucus gray type of discharge adherent to the vaginal walls with BV. Um, there are some simple, and I don't want to say simple in a bad way, but there are some simple, inexpensive, approachable tests that we can do. Uh, and I've used these in my work within the United States and outside of the United States, typically in underdeveloped countries. You can do that with test. Most places I've worked has KOH and microscopy ready and prepared. You can even use like a litmus paper or, you know, those old little strips of um, blue paper we used in uh, seventh grade science class to test for pH. Uh, and again, you can visualize clue cells on microscopy or even budding yeast and pseudohyphae on microscopy. I always say if you're in a fancy place, you may have access to a polymerase um, chain reaction or PCR test or a nucleic acid amplification test. These really are paramount to um, sort of specifying the strain and whether that strain of BV and yeast is common or rare and if it's susceptible to certain uh, antimicrobial, antifungal treatments or not. Uh, the one I use in my practice is up on your screen and that's from Medical Diagnostic Laboratories or MDL uh, and that's called One Swab. Typically it tests for 24 different pathogens and you can include uh, things like mycoplasma and ureaplasm and uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia just to again rule out concomitant STDs. Um, but it's a really great way to test again for the strain of BV and yeast to make sure you're giving appropriate treatment. Again, that's paramount. Uh, so if you don't have these fancy tests, again, you're relying on what we said earlier and using that diagnostic criteria saying it's a symptomatic episode, uh, even if you don't have objective data to support it. And as you see on the screen, these are your classic symptoms of yeast, which I think we've reviewed already. And then your classic symptoms of bacterial vaginosis, again, which we have reviewed on previous slides. So in my practice, we have a kind of a standard protocol I don't know if you can see it, but actually the whole staff is given um, one of, let me see if I can pull it out for you. So they're given one of these little folders and in it uh, is sort of a table that we have printed out for them. And on it are some common pathogens that might result from our testing, including bacterial vaginosis and yeast. And so our little tip table includes what you see on your screen. I really just sort of trans, um, uh, ported it from my uh, chart onto your slideshow for tonight. So y'all had access to this indefinitely. But we start with oral metronidazole or what we call flagell uh, here in North America. And that is one tablet twice a day for a week. Typically, we're not using the Metro gel as often unless a patient truly cannot swallow the large oral tablet of flagell, or if she's had sort of a reaction to, to that orally in a first pass metabolism type of way. Um, if those are the cases, we'll go to Metro gel. And again, you have those instructions. I don't want to waste your time by reading them to you. Clindamycin, whether in topical form or oral form, is a great option to the azoles. Uh, like tinidazole and metronidazole. Uh, so again, if someone has a sensitivity or allergy to those, clindamycin is a great second line treatment. Uh, I do want to make sure I drive the point home that we go in order on the screen and tinidazole is a third line therapy for us. 
In the United States, we do have difficulty with insurance coverage for Solasec. Solasec is an oral therapy given in a little sachet or pouch. It almost looks like a little pack of sugar. And this two gram powder sachet is an oral treatment. They can mix it into, um, we always say sort of a thing of applesauce or yogurt. It tends to be more well tolerated that way, but you can certainly put it in a glass of water. Just the powder granules do send, tend to be um, more tolerated when it's in a, a cup of pudding. <laughs> that's probably because I'm a mother and that's what I do for my kids. It is important to know that these do have some common adverse reactions, which is why it's really important in a moment to talk about those preventative measures, right? None of us like to be treated with these medications all of the time. Prevention is key. And even though I am American, a lot of times Americans don't like prevention, even though I really try to encourage them towards prevention. Um, and it's just such an important thing to encourage for our patients because of these adverse reactions to the treatments. If we're just waiting for the next infection and we're just treating it and causing more symptoms because of the treatments, then doesn't it make sense to really encourage prevention instead? Look at these adverse reactions. A lot of gastrointestinal issues with these medications used to treat bacterial vaginosis. Uh, and these GI issues range from nausea to colitis. And they, you can even have a headache from these and even cause yeast, which is the other thing we need to talk about. So on your screen now, you see those standard treatment options that we use to treat yeast vaginitis or vulvovaginitis and at candida. Usually it's going to be an antifungal medication and that's uh, typically in the United States going to be um, ranging from what we've already discussed to monostat or myconazole, which is an over-the-counter treatment available in America, and then fluconazole, which is a prescription tablet not available over-the-counter in America, and we call that diflucan. A lot of women prefer that sort of one pill. It's easy. Um, a lot of women don't want to insert a cream in a vagina that already has a creamy white discharge. And I completely understand that, right? Because with any of these treatments for yeast that you see up on your screen, they also have adverse side effects, not to mention the cumbersome nature of trying to plunge a bunch of creamy white stuff up in your vagina every night for seven nights. Uh, so prevention's key because these adverse effects of taking medications uh, should not be overlooked. Uh, we can have headache, nausea, uh, diarrhea, indigestion, and so much irritation from taking the treatments that are supposed to help this irritation. And I really encourage y'all to not take this lightly. Our patients go through a lot and we may scoff at these vaginal infections because we think, well, it's just a vagina infection, right? Things could be worse, but this is life altering. And even though it's not life threatening, quality of life for our patients is so important. So is there another way, right, to control the situation and prevent these infections that are so frustrating for our patients? The answer is yes. Utiva offers this yeast treatment, which in my practice, I will also use as a prevention. But first, let's talk about the treatment. Boric acid, I think we're all familiar with that. It's been around for many, many, many years. It's found naturally as a mineral in the environment. And it increases the permeability of that um, uh, cell wall on the pathogen, right, on the yeast. And destroying that really inhibits its ability to form. Um, I, I know this sounds really aggressive, but boric acid has the word acid in the title, right? So the whole point, um, even though acid sounds dangerous, but it's to make the environment more acidic, to get that pH balance back to normal for the vagina, and that will help mitigate symptoms and prevent a recurrence. Now, it's really important if y'all have never used boric acid to remind your patient it is inserted with one finger as deeply into the vagina lumen as possible and then go to bed. So I tell my patients to do this nightly, assuming that they will lay flat and that therapy won't come out while they're asleep. After they insert it with one finger every night at bedtime, they really need to wash their hands thoroughly with warm soapy water because this is fatal if orally contaminated or swallowed. 
So encourage them to keep that boric acid high on a safe shelf in the home, away from children, away from pets as well. Uh, cats have been known to investigate. So just make sure you keep it in a safe, cool, dark, dry location and tell your patients to wash their hands thoroughly after every insertion each night into the vagina. And that's done again for four, 14 consecutive nights or two weeks total. So we talked a little bit about its mechanism of action and how it works so effectively. Um, oftentimes we will even uh, give a trial of boric acid for a woman with a negative swab who is um, really frustrated by the odor uh, from her vagina. So if you have access to a PCR or a nucleic acid amplification test and they continue to come back negative, but you are concerned because her symptoms are really consistent with yeast or BV and a recurrence, it is okay to empirically give boric acid to the vagina nightly for 14 nights. Um, because as you can see, it disrupts the hyphae of the yeast and inhibits the ability of that uh, yeast strain to carry out its formation. Uh, so this is again, um, Health Canada approved. And I, I think we're, Utiva, you can correct me in a moment when we get into the more product, uh, deep dive into the product, uh, it's availability in other countries, including the United States. Um, but currently it is available in Canada. And as you can see, it's really helping to reduce the overgrowth of the bacteria. I always explain to my patients that having a little bit of this yeast or bacteria in the vagina is common. It's almost like having a roommate, right? But what do you do when your roommate gets out of control? It, it becomes a, a problem for you, right? So how do you maintain a good relationship with your sort of flatmate or your roommate or your apartment mate, right? Because we don't want things to get out of control. So always describe it as such to your patients, right? I think Patients become alarmed when they think they have a bacteria, they feel unclean, they feel dirty, and they shouldn't. It's natural to have a little bit of this at all times. We just wanna keep it quiet and keep it manageable so that roommate or bacteria doesn't get out of control. And that's what this product does. And that's how I explain it to my patients. So we have lots of research um, to really drive that point home that not only is it effective for a current infection, but it also helps to reduce recurrence rates. And that's what we're here for tonight, right? What are the tips and tricks to treat that yeast infection, but also reduce recurrence? The other things that are helpful and mitigate a recurrence are things you probably already tell your patient, but it's good to hear again, right? I actually have this printed as a tip sheet for my patients and hand it to each and every one. It just reminds them to use really a mild soap in the vulvo vaginal area when they shower and just avoid soaking in bathtubs or, or using bath salts and bubble bath products. Those are often caustic and irritants to the vulvar skin. Um, if necessary, when someone's on their menstrual cycle, make sure that they are encouraged to use cotton products like pads and tampons. And then wearing cotton underwear, right? So synthetic undergarments can really change the pH balance and sort of wick bacteria uh, from the, the rectum towards the vagina and towards the bladder. Uh, no douching, although there is some good research to support just a plain tap water douche in recurrence rates of BV. Avoid scrubbing the area with, with a washcloth. You know, I've said it in other lectures before for Utiva. A good rule of thumb to tell your female patients is if you would not do it to your two-year-old baby girl, then do not do it to yourself. And I am the mother of daughters. I would never douche my two children, so I should not douche myself. I would never wax their vagina, so I should not wax mine. I would never scrub their baby vaginas with a washcloth or a loofah. So why would I do that to myself? So it sounds simple and it may even sound crass and unprofessional, but it is a useful tip. And if you remember that, I think it makes sense to most of your patients to tell them that rule. Don't do it to your baby, then don't do it to yourself. Um, maintaining appropriate hydration and having a good compliance with health and diet overall is critical to preventing a recurrence of BV and yeast.
There are other supplements that Utiva may not manufacture. Clarivy by the Bonafide company is one of those. Uh, Bonafide makes this capsule that you see here that's taken orally and it's one pill every day. Usually uh, we recommend it for the 15 days per month around the time of menstruation. Um, if a woman's not menstruating, she can sort of pick a random 15 days to take one pill every month for at least six months for the best results. And as you can see here, it's really just restoring that lactobacilli to the uh, vaginal area. There's no research that suggests putting yogurt directly down there. So please don't tell your patients to do that. Um, and eating yogurt actually doesn't help either, even if it has a large amount of lactobacilli or probiotic in it. Other preventative measures um, when it comes to um, prescription therapies, right? Like we mentioned earlier, extended courses of oral metronidazole or metrogel twice a week for six months. And you have access to these slides. So again, I don't want to waste your Q&A time by reading them to you, but you can see there are a lot of really great ways to prevent a recurrence listed up here. Um, typically, if I'm going to use Utiva boric acid product nightly for 14 nights as a way to prevent recurrence, I really recommend, and again, this is expert opinion off label, but I recommend rescuing the vagina. So boric acid is caustic. It's an acid. The whole point is to sort of destroy that membrane. So the pathogen cannot uh, recreate itself and maintain cellular function, but that can also strip the vagina of its good flora and fauna of its good lactobacilli, right? So how do we rescue the vagina? So I usually give my patients rescue estrogen therapy. Uh, I am a huge believer that estrogen cream is for everyone for everyone. I give it to my breast cancer patients. Um, anyone can use estrogen cream, truly, honestly. And I think after a round of boric acid from Utiva to prevent a recurrence of yeast, for example, or BV, um, rescuing the vagina with nightly estrogen cream uh, is a wonderful idea. I usually have that patient do it nightly for at least two weeks and then a maintenance with a fingertip amount of estrogen prescription cream applied to the opening um, every other night. I use my cream every single night and I will forever. It's a great way to prevent UTIs and other infections, but tip and trick, also a good way to rescue the vagina and restore normal pH balance after you've kind of killed off the pathogen with boric acid. What are some other things a patient can rescue her vagina with, right? What are some ways to not only prevent the BV, but potentially restore the normal pH and goodness of the vagina, especially if she's adverse to estrogen cream, even though you've reassured her estrogens for everyone, right? So the other option would be something like Utiva's um, product with hyaluronic acid. There are a lot of companies, not just Utiva, that make hyaluronic acid. And there's a lot uh, like Trimacin and other uh, ointments. Uh, Shirley Weir with Menopause Chicks has a hyaluronic acid therapy as well. But these products are really effective, again, in restoring the normal pH balance. So we want it to be acidic. We want that good vagina pH to be between 4 and 4.5. And bacterial vaginosis really sits right around 4.5 to 5.0, right? More alkaline. So products like Utiva Bacterial Vaginosis Relief is just a gel that you can sort of plunge up in the vaginal lumen every night at bedtime uh, for seven nights. And then as you can see here on the screen, sort of restoring that vagina after the initial um, BV treatment in order to prevent a recurrence would be using one applicator uh, at bedtime uh, for three nights after every menstrual cycle. And again, someone who's not menstruating can sort of pick a random three nights every month, but keep it about at the same pace or same timing every month. 
So we all know how it works, right? Sort of this hyaluronic acid or lactic acid um, is just helping to produce more lactobacilli or good bacteria in the vaginal lumen and restore that acidic pH. And this acidity has been shown to disrupt the biofilms and it just aids in keeping good bacteria and removing sort of that pathogenic bacteria from the vaginal mucosa, overall reducing inflammation in hopes of reducing that vulvar pain, irritation, redness, and even burning that patients sometimes get. So again, don't know if it's game time ready in other countries like America, but in Canada, uh, we feel it's available now and it does all of these wonderful things. And it's a really great way, again, to just reduce that sort of, um, notion that one of your patients may have an excessive amount of discharge or odor, even though we're still reassuring her that it is normal to have a lot of discharge with a musty odor. So treat the actual infection based on objective data and then prevent a recurrence by using a product like boric acid or hyaluronic acid. Jyoti, I hope I got through that quickly. I don't know. I'm checking my time. You're, you're, <laughs> I think you're I'm good for time. So, Perfect. Okay, time. good. Phew. <laughs> and I apologize. I do talk too much. So I tried to talk really, really fast. So I apologize. But uh, just to drive the points uh, home tonight that we discussed with the treatment of BV and yeast vaginitis and the recurrence of both. those. Let's go through a couple of eight year old sexually active African American female, right? So we know what she's at risk for just based on ethnicity. Um, she's never been pregnant, never had children, excuse me, and no known medical condition. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I think Dr. Oakley had a tech difficulty. If you just hang on for a couple minutes, I'm sure she will come right back on. Just to give you guys an update, that was her, I believe she has one more slide after that, and then we will move into the Q&A. So we are perfect for time. If you want to like hop on over to the bathroom or grab a drink, We have the time. Are you there? Yeah. Okay, you're back. You Thank you. That was quick. So, Jyoti, I was in the middle, and your computer said the meeting is now being recorded, and it cut me off. Oh, that's strange. I Today is a strange day for Zoom. I'm not sure. It's okay, happening. but I'm okay. Are you sure you can hear me and see me? Perfectly, yeah. You just need to share your screen again. Okay, let me try. I'm so sorry that it happened to everyone. It's okay. Is it is it good or bad? Good. Yeah, you're good. You're you're good. Are you sure? Perfect. Okay, I apologize, everyone. I'm so sorry. So again, just briefly, again, I don't want to waste your time. And maybe you stepped away to use the restroom because I heard Jyoti say you could go use the restroom. But if you're back with me, case number one is that 28-year-old sexually active African-American female. So again, with her ethnicity, we know what she might be at risk for. Never had children um, and no known medical conditions that are relevant. And her only prescription listed is an oral contraceptive pill. And she has had four positive swabs in the past year with Gardnerella vaginalis, which would be one of the most common pathogens causing that bacterial vaginosis. So again, we know she's African-American putting her at higher risk for BV. And it looks like she's been diagnosed and objectively confirmed as having a recurrence. So I think what's super important is to ask what the patient's goal is first and foremost with these cases that we have. Um, and with her goal, it may be to not just reduce the recurrence of BV, right? I.e. how to prevent it from happening again, but just to maintain a good pH balance, prevent odor and decrease the amount of discharge she's having. So we want to meet those goals and we can't meet them without asking her what they are. So you're always going to do that physical exam, including a pelvic exam with a speculum. Again, you want to make sure that you have a baseline swab, and that's my recommendation. So I get a lot of these referrals. They may not have an active infection in the moment on the day that I see them. But what's nice about a PCR or nucleic acid amplification test is 
they're very sensitive. So even though the patient may not be symptomatic and have any signs of an infection right now, that swab can say no, right? It can confirm there's no infection, get you a good baseline. And if there is, it gives you those susceptibilities towards what the best treatment might be for her. And if there is any resistance uh, to the strain that she has. So I think, again, during that pelvic exam, obtaining a swab or culture is really critical. And then we want to make sure we reduce that recurrence of BV for this patient because she's never conceived and she may want to maintain future fertility. Again, we haven't asked her, but she may want more children. In this case, she did. And so we want to mitigate the risk of preterm labor and delivery for her uh, by removing that recurrence of BV. So what are some preventions? Well, you already know that we can certainly use that Utiva hyaluronic acid, lactic acid, sort of BV vaginal health gel insert every night. And our very sweet African-American patient can insert that for three nights after her menstrual cycle has ended every single month. And that would be a great way for her to prevent a recurrence of BV. As long as our baseline swab is normal and she doesn't have a current infection that we may need to treat. But also reference that earlier slide in my presentation that lists all the other sort of prescription medication ways to prevent a BV recurrence, as long as you inform her of those adverse side effects. So in case number two, we have a 43-year-old G2P2 Caucasian woman Again, two pregnancies, two vaginal births, not currently sexually active with her husband. She does have a diabetes type 2 It did it again. Jyoti, can you hear me okay? Yes. You know what, Dr. Oakley, since it's like one of the last slides, yeah. why don't you just you just just read it out? I think we're yeah, I think we're good. So, you know, that yeah. that that second case study, really her goal was to avoid that redness, irritation, and discomfort to the vulva so that she could regain a sense of non-painful intimacy with her husband. So, you know, that's why it's really important to ask them about their goals uh, to mitigate the real symptoms that bother them. So even though she was happy with us to prevent a recurrence of yeast, it was really more about giving her vagina back some normal, robust, sort of well estrogenized tissue to prevent pain with intercourse. Um, and regaining intimacy was her main goal. So what we did was treat her with the Utiva boric acid product. And again, that's inserted vaginally nightly for two weeks. And then I did choose uh, in my sort of off-label practice to use rescue estrogen therapy. And that topical estrogen cream was inserted with an applicator nightly for two more weeks. And then she was able to regain intimacy without pain and discomfort, uh, maintaining that topical estrogen uh, two or three nights a week. So I hope those two case studies helped to center all of you around recurrence of BV and yeast and how we can talk to our patients and mitigate their symptoms and prevent a recurrence. As always, I'm grateful to Jyoti and Utiva uh, for allowing me to speak with you tonight. I thank you for your time. Uh, my references were listed at the end of my slideshow. I apologize you weren't able to see that, but I do thank you for your time, kindness, and patience. And I'm happy to hear some questions if we still have time. Yes. Okay. Um, we have we have a good amount of time for questions. Uh, I figured out. I'm pretty sure I figured out echo issue. I don't think I did. So everyone bear with me. I was trying to figure that out in the background. Um, I'm going to do my best here. So question number one, what is the normal amount of discharge? So you had referenced a shot cup and there was some confusion around the milliliters. You had said four. What is it really? People thought 30 milliliters is, is way too much. 
<laughs> so good, good point. I don't know what kind of shot glass y'all are using, <laughs> but no, four milliliters um, is, a, you know, a normal amount of discharge. But I, I think my point was just to reassure patients that, as the one slide said, that an increased amount of discharge is still permissible, right? So I think the audience is correct in saying a shot glass can hold about 30 ounces, uh, excuse me, 30 milliliters. Um, again, my American brain works in ounces. Um, so a shot glass can hold 30 milliliters. Um, so even though four is normal, it's a point of reassuring that patient. Otherwise she'll fixate. Like I have five, I have six, I have seven milliliters. And, and you think, oh my gosh, just calm down. Like it's okay. So as long as that discharge is from a well estrogenized reproductive uh, age vagina and it's snot colored or mucus colored thin and watery, and it fills a 30 milliliter shot glass every day. I think it's a good way for that patient to visualize and feel reassured, but the audience is correct. I did say four. That makes so much more sense. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. Yes. So next question, can you pass BB to your male or female part? Like, can you pass that? That is an excellent question. And I'm sorry I didn't really drive that point home. Since it, neither one of these that we're speaking of tonight, yeast or BV, are considered a sexually transmitted disease, then we do feel it is unlikely to be transferred from female to female partner, female to male, male to female. Um, as always, I just think making sure our skin is hygienic and our sex toys are hygienic, right? And everything's appropriately cleaned and washed uh, before using any body part or item for penetration is key. Um, but since it's not considered an STD or STI, then my answer has to be no, you can't. Okay. All right. Next question. Can you get recurrent yeast infections due to incomplete patient treatment? Example, one to two daily boric acid capsules only until symptoms resolve. Uh, Symptom-free periods between culture-positive infections. What is suggested to So I guess I'm a little confused. Someone said two to three boric acid a day. Yeah. One to two daily boric acid capsules they're taking only until symptoms result. So that's way off label. I, I can, you know, maybe if I spoke to that care provider, I could understand where she or he is coming from. But again, just one 600 milligram capsule of boric acid nightly is appropriate. I think doing more than one nightly is a dis advantageous to your vagina health and the pH balance and lactobacilli amount. Um, so I guess um, when we say inappropriate treatment can lead to reoccurrence, that is a true statement. That was part of your question you just asked. Uh, so doing empiric treatment or short courses or sort of made up courses of treatment um, can lead to a recurrence. Uh, and so 50% of women will have a recurrence due to inappropriate treatment within a six month time frame. So that, that is legitimate, but I can't say that two or three capsules of boric acid is, is appropriate or inappropriate. It's just not part of the recommended treatment protocol period. Okay. Thank you. So do you ever, uh, do two grams of metronidazole as a single dose? That's more common here. Yeah, absolutely. You, you can do that. It's typically for the treatment of trichomoniasis, which is an STD that has a very similar pH to BV. Um, obviously a different microscopy, a different pathogen and considered an STD. Uh, so typically that would be the, the dose that treats trichomoniasis and your partner would need to be treated um, in that case by their care provider to prevent a recurrence. But yes, I do not see why you can't give that. It's um, inferior to metronidazole twice a day for seven days, but there's no reason why you couldn't do that single dose. Um, it's interesting to see the differences between the two countries, right? Like what's, what's, yes. it's very interesting. 
I did just see um, something pop up on my screen. I don't know why I haven't seen anything else, but someone just said, um, that's crazy. There's a huge difference between four milliliters and 40 milliliters for <laughs> vaginal discharge. And I, and, I, and I think, you know, that is a valuable um, sort of alert. It, it doesn't mean that I'm handing you a bunch of BS tonight. It just means that the vagina is that crazy, right? And we know that, that some women will bleed that much every day during their menstrual cycle, four versus 40. But that variability is common with the output from a uterus and a vagina. Um, so what that thing bleeds or has for discharge volumes is so wildly variable. And I think the bottom line tonight is not to focus on a number um, if you're in the audience, but to just focus on reassuring your patient that having discharge really is normal. And we, we have to quit trying to fix discharge, right? Tonight's focus is we're trying to prevent infection, not discharge. And we have to start reassuring our female patients that discharge is okay when there's no infection. Perfect. It's a good point to drive home, I think, for any woman at any age. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so what can you do for patients who say boric acid burns? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's such a hard thing to navigate because it is acid. It does burn. And that's why I, I really try to rescue their vagina with the estrogen cream immediately afterwards. So what can we do to help for those nightly treatments uh, for 14 nights? you absolutely can have them insert estrogen every morning. There's no reason they can't. Again, that's not going to be um, written down in the textbooks. That's sort of an expert opinion of mine as a vaginal surgeon, but they can insert with the applicator estrogen cream every morning and then put the boric acid in every night. And that may help to decrease some of the discomfort with using boric acid. Um, we have a lot of questions. So That's a good thing. I, yeah, tons. I'm scanning through them. So, okay. How can you increase compliance of boric acid 14 days? Uh, it's similar to the question you just said, when there is irritation to the skin after only a couple days, should they, they're getting that irritation, should they stop the skin? <sighs> I really encourage my patients to continue, right? Okay. Um, I, I say, let's just push through the treatment. I know it's uncomfortable. A lot of treatments for a lot of medical conditions are, and it's not that we want to inflict pain. They could also, if the symptoms are more at the surface or vulva, you could try to give your patient some topical lidocaine jelly. Uh, that's usually available at most pharmacies in North America and, and trying to use a similar non-prescription salve, uh, which in America we call Aquaphor or even Vaseline or A&D ointment. You know, if the irritation is on the outside or vulva, I think those are reasonable to, again, give some comfort to that patient so she can get through the treatment. What about for patients with recurrent uh, BB or yeast vaginitis who are taking suppressive antibiotics or um, as needed after sales? I've seen this a lot in postmenopausal women. What are your thoughts? And so great question. You know, are they on the suppressive antibiotics for something like urinary tract infection? Because that would concern me because suppressive antibiotics for long-term use, especially six months or longer, can uh, increase your risk of colon cancer. So I think the first thing I would say is how can we get you off the suppressive antibiotics? But if it's something they really need to be on for other medical conditions, I can respect and honor that decision. Um, and I think really just maintaining them on any one of the prescription treatments or Utiva products that we talked about in the slideshow tonight is a great way to prevent that recurrence. So again, whether it's Metrogel twice a week, um, or the boric acid or hyaluronic acid products from Utiva. I think these are all great options, again, to prevent a recurrence of BV and yeast. Okay. So the next one is a very, I love this question because it's, it's not something you would typically get. And I think it's a very important one, especially understanding like when, what, like how you don't want to um, ingest boric acid, right? Like it's not yeah. safe to do so. So how long, do you counsel on abstinence of oral sex 
after you support gout? What about intercourse without condoms? Any concerns, assuming no current symptoms? Yeah, that is an excellent question. Thank you so much for whoever submitted that. You're going to get a variable answer depending on the care provider that you ask. But typically when you've completed a 14 night course of boric acid, I find that it is safest when I ask my patients to wait one week after the last dose before engaging in any oral intimacy or other forms of penetration intimacy. So again, you will get a variable response. I don't, I, to be honest, Jyoti, I don't even know if Utiva has a recommendation um, on their label. I don't think there is no. one. No. Yeah, but I usually say one week. Okay, good. We will put that in our Q and A. I think it's a great, a great question. Um, okay, so let's see what's the next one. I saw Doctor Pool, Doctor Doctor Pool, shout out. It popped up on my screen. We, we've known yeah. each, yes, we've known each other a long time. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so um, I have a patient with a history of uterine cancer treated with a hysterectomy in her twenties. She is now eighty and has vulvo vaginal atrophy. Can I use estrogen? Can I use estrogen cream on? Absolutely. Estrogen is for everyone, E, E, estrogen for everyone. Uh, so it's, it's not a systemic estrogen, um, no real fear with your sweet 80 year old and her remote history of uterine cancer. Uh, I think the safest way is to have her ignore the applicator and just use a blueberry sized dollop on her fingertip and really rub it at the opening of the vagina between the labia minora. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So um, next question is, I have a patient whose gynecologist from Iran recommended a vulvar, vulvar cleanser pH balanced. That's the name of the product. I saw the bottle. She comes in at least one to two times a month with symptoms of itch and excess discharge. She has never been sexually active. Her repeat vag um, vaginal CNS is either normal or shows altered flora. I have recommended everything on your list and, then, and I am out of ideas. Any other thoughts? Nothing on exam. Yeah, this is such a classic patient. I mean, first of all, she needs to quit the douching. I'm not sure what product that really is. And again, you would have to twist my arm to even recommend the tap water douche. Uh, so I just say no douching, no waxing, um, no scrubbing with a washcloth or loofah. If we have removed all sort of uh, contact irritants, and you've really gone through that list with her and you've tried all of the uh, uh, products tonight from Utiva, like a boric acid 14 night trial or a hyaluronic uh, insert uh, a few nights every month. And really this um, participant tonight has tried all these things. Uh, the only thing I didn't hear mentioned, Jyoti, is that estrogen cream. And I would use that in a heartbeat to help control those symptoms of sort of burning discomfort and irritation that she's having, particularly with negative objective testing. So this sounds like just a contact dermatitis in all honesty. If you, you know, I, I will even randomly punch biopsy that vulvar skin. You may not see a concrete discrete lesion, but a random punch biopsy can go a long way with just reassuring you and the patient that uh, it's just dermatitis and, and nothing else. Um, again, estrogen cream is going to be your best friend. Oh, I just saw a pop-up. It said vulvar cleanser. So again, I, I just to specify, I'm not sure what's in that vulvar cleanser or, um, I think a better way to put it and as crass and unprofessional as this sounds, Jyoti, when you go to your local supermarket or superstore, which would be Walmart here in America, there is absolutely no aisle dedicated to penis shampoo or testicle wash or male douche. Not at all. You will never find that product anywhere. You know why? Because men are not obsessed with the cleanliness, odor, and general appearance of their penis and testicles. Women are, we just are. And there are aisles and aisles at your supermarket and superstore dedicated to making vulvas and vaginas look pretty and smell like roses. The vagina is a self-cleaning oven. So whether this vulvar cleanser from Iran or is a douche or not a douche, it's a product that is potentially irritating that woman's skin. And we need to quit selling these things to our female patients. 
Um, I think it gets very confusing, but I guarantee you there's no such thing for men. And the vagina is a self-cleaning oven. Leave it alone. Yeah, absolutely. And there's uh, several other questions along that line, like what about this soap? What about this? Um, we won't get into the details of every single one. We don't have enough time, but I think overall we can go on with that statement of just yeah. leave it alone. If it's some sort of cleansing wash meant to for it to like look pretty and smell nice to yeah. hair away. But again, it gets back to what I said at the, earlier. Would you do it to your two-year-old baby girl? And if you wouldn't, do not do it to yourself. Good rule of thumb. I think, you know, we're all experts tonight. And I think the whole audience has come with some really good practices uh, in their occupations. And I, for one, love to hear all these suggestions and comments that are popping up, right? Not just not just the questions, um, but I think we're all experts, Jyoti, and everybody has some tips and tricks to give. So hopefully, um, Utiva sort of puts those together. Yeah, for everyone. Yeah. It's great to see. And when you guys look at the recording, um, you'll be able to go through the comments in the chat to see if you can glean any additional information from your peers. That's good. Um, you know, I'm going to go with two more questions. Um, okay. And then let's see, two or three more questions. Okay. So next one is, can we use boric acid and flagell at the same time? Uh, oh, sorry, boric acid and? Flagell at the same time. Oh, great question. Um, there's no... And the, the pharmacologist and pharmacist tonight can certainly weigh in on this, but I am not aware of any pharmacologic reason why you can't, but I don't see the benefit. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so um, choose one or the other. I think it's an old wives tale, but there truly is something to be said for if you throw too much at a patient, how do you know what's really working and how do you know what's causing the adverse event or effect? So I think one at a time is just a much safer, reasonable, prudent approach. Okay. Makes sense. Um, the next question, you know, you can just cover it real briefly, but I think like we cannot emphasize this enough. Um, it's about oral ingestion of boric acid. So what are the primary symptoms of oral ingestion prior, of boric acid prior to fatality? My understanding is it is not fatal upon what the consumption of one 600 milligram dose. Um, but can you speak to that? Yeah, I'm sorry. I am, I'm not that smart. <laughs> so I don't know the symptoms right before fatality. Great question. And I'm sure we can uh, confirm that, look that up and, and, and get back to the audience tonight. So I apologize. I don't know no, that. That's okay. What I can say from um, what we know on the Utiva side is it's not, fatal if they accidentally take one dose, um, but they should not continue taking more, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we said keep it in a cool, dry, safe location, very high away from pets and children. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, should we treat the patient always when the swab comes back positive for BP? I have a patient who had three swabs that comes back positive when she received two times ant antibiotics, two times. You do not have to treat a positive swab or, or culture. I, I agree with that inherent statement within the question. Um, so I think it's really, what are the patient goals? And hopefully that uh, point was really uh illuminated during my case studies, right? Is the goal just to prevent recurrence or get rid of an odor or infection? You know, focus on the symptoms, focus on the goal. Uh, just like with urinary tract infections, you also don't have to treat those. A lot of BV are self-limiting, a lot of UTIs are self-limiting as well. So no, you do not have to just treat a positive culture. Okay. Um, how common is, I, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, how common is can Candida glabrata. Um, yeah. Follow up to that is patient just diagnosed with this. Should I treat? He has brownish discharge. Okay, so glabrata is far less common than albicans, uh, but it is one of sort of the top three strains of yeast. Um, a lot of times I'll see glabrata um, 
and patients who are referred to me, they've seen their primary care OBGYN several times for yeast and the Diflucan or Myconazole has never really treated it. Um, and then we do a more specific uh, PCR or nucleic acid amplification test and confirm it's glabratum. So again, rare, but common in those resistant strains, if that's a decent answer for you. And in those situations, um, again, using boric acid or even gentian violet, I know that's sort of old school, but you can sort of cover it with liquid gentian violet. And these are great treatments. Now, there was a mention maybe of brown discharge in the question, or did I hear you yes. correctly? And so I think making sure that brown discharge is not from atrophy, which can create a brown discharge just from the atrophy and thinning of the tissue and the need for estrogen. And then making sure that brown discharge is not from postmenopausal bleeding if they still have a uterus. So just, you can treat the brown discharge, treat it as a yeast and do your thing, but let's just make sure we rule out more concerning medical issues as well. Yeah, the um, question, the person who asked the question said the patient's in the face. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So I think I, it's, it could, the brown discharge, if I'm understanding the question correctly, could be from the glabrata for sure. It's so oh. irritating to that um, vulvar skin, so caustic uh, to that skin. And then with multiple treatments, there's a bit more friability to the skin. So I think again, rescuing that skin after appropriate treatment of the glabrata first uh, with some estrogen cream, even in a patient in her thirties is absolutely reasonable. Okay. Thanks. I'm gonna ask Great question. Yeah, These are amazing. Very good questions. Um, I'm going to ask you one more. So let's see. Okay. Should we wait a certain amount of days after the treatment to, um, with boric acid, or whatever the treatment is to start the preventative treatment with boric acid. You know um, that, yeah, you don't, you, you don't have to wait. A lot of people immediately move to the Metro gel twice a week for six months. Um, but if after boric acid, for example, um, or you can do the Utiva recommendation to just use that boric acid, um, again, around the time of the menstrual cycle, like we said, um, or the hyaluronic acid again around the time of the menstrual cycle. So I think it all depends on the, the menstrual cycle, right? As to sort of when you start the, the prevention. So great question, but I think timing it around the menstrual cycle, like we said on previous slides is, is paramount. Okay, great. Um, you know what, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna cap it at that. Um, I think we had a great Q and A. I hope that everybody learned a lot and I hope that a lot of you guys got some of your burning questions answered. Uh, Dr. Oakley, I want to thank you so much for the great talk as always. Um, I hope you enjoyed sharing, uh, which is, I'm sure we all enjoyed uh, listening and learning. Uh, I enjoyed um, just being allowed to do this and learning from y'all with your comments and questions. You know, it gives me a lot of things to go research some more and look up and learn some more. So I appreciate each and every one of you. I'll leave the meeting. I know y'all need to talk about a few things regarding products, but is there anything else you need before I head out? Um, that's it. That's everything. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate everybody. I hope everyone has a great day or night, depending on where you are. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks.